Dear Father in heaven, it's uh, such a pleasure that you have given each and every one of us that we may come before you in spirit and in truth. Father, it's a very special blessing that we've been called to come to this uh, prophet, uh, uh, school of the prophets, that we may learn what it is that you'd have us to do in these last days. We know, Father, that uh, you're soon to come. We know that you want your people ready. And your word says that I wish that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So, Father, that's our prayer today, that we can reach as many as we possibly can. You know those that we need to talk to, Father, so we would pray that you would guide and direct us. And Father, we also pray that uh, you would take a coal from your throne and put place on uh, our Brother Pippinger's uh, lips today as we go on with this study, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I assume that Brother Duane pulled this out the Pioneer CD-ROM, which has uh, some historical documents in it. Is that right? Jay and so, Loughborough wrote that. Loughborough wrote this. Um, At the close of the 2300 days in 1844, as Elder Joseph Bates went out to teach the third angel's message and the Sabbath truth, one of his favorite subjects was tracing the Advent movement. He would start with Jeremiah 31, 21. Set thee up waymarks, make thee high heaps, set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. Those who heard those talks urged him, urged him to print this discourse. This was in 1846. Then, as when his tract on the Sabbath question was written, he had no money with which to print it. A widow with two children who had a garden spot and a little cabin out in the country came and said to him, I can stop at my brother-in-law's with my two children. They will care for them in the daytime while I go to work for the neighbors. I will sell the little place and give you half the money with which to print the book. I will get along till I can get another home. I'm not guessing this. The sister was one of six who, in 1845, signed a covenant with brother and sister Bates to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. The six were among those who, in 1854, I organized into a Seventh-day Adventist church in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. In 1853 and 1854, when laboring in company with Brother Bates, I often heard him speak on his favorite theme, which he titled, Waymarks and High Heaps. He would connect with his text the words of Paul in Hebrews 10, 32-39, thus showing that there was a similarity in the experience of the apostles and those giving the Advent message. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great flight of affliction. And it seemed like there was more to it that dropped off. But, uh, okay. Okay. The work beginning began in self-sacrifice. It will end with self-sacrifice. Um, we're going to start with Revelation 17 at this point. Of course, we want to understand Revelation 17 correctly, but this is also one of the strongest supports for Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Hopefully you recognize that the sequence of events in Revelation 13 agree perfectly with the sequence of events in, in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Daniel 11, 40 begins with the very verse in the Bible that identifies the deadly wound of the papacy and one of the themes in those verses is how the deadly wound is healed. Revelation 13 is where we get the phrase, the deadly wound. Um, they're the same stories. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is the same story as Revelation 13. Uh, the only difference between, well, not the only difference. <laughs> one of the primary differences between Daniel 11 and Revelation 13 is that when Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is dealing with the deadly wound of the papacy, it's dealing with it from the perspective of the papacy, the king of the north. This is the healing of the deadly wound with the focus on the papacy. Revelation 13 is telling the same story, but the focus of Revelation 13 isn't so much the papacy, it's describing the role of the false prophet, the United States. Same story, uh, but Daniel 11, the king of the north, Revelation 13, the lamb-like beast. And as we take up Revelation 17, we'll see that 
it's the same story, how the deadly wound is healed. Uh, but the focus here, uh, though on the, on the papacy, but really it's dealing with the relationship of the papacy with the dragon power, the ten kings. Uh, the beast, the dragon, and false prophet each have their own special passage and prophecy that portrays uh, their part in the work of restor restoring the power of the papacy. Education 123, 124. When thus searched out and brought together, they will be found to be perfectly fitted to one another. Each gospel is a supplement to the others, and every prophecy and explanation of another, every truth a development of some other truth. The types of the Jewish economy are made plain by the gospel. Every principle in the word of God has its place, every fact its bearing. And the complete structure in design and execution bears testimony to its author, such a structure no mind but that of the infinite could conceive or fashion. Every fact has its bearing. Uh, if you have opportunity to go out and share Revelation 17 and Adventism, you'll find there is a variety of ideas about what Revelation 17 is identifying. And from uh, my humble evaluation, one of the most important verses in Revelation 17 is verse 3. If you're going to be faithful to verse 3, a lot of the um, ideas that are out there disappear, like morning fog. And we're not at verse 3 yet, but that's the point of that quote. Every fact has its bearing, and there is a fact established in verse 3 um, that really sets the tone of Revelation 17. But we want to begin with another important uh, part of Revelation 17, the first two verses. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Here, to me, is one of the most important um, literary um, truths in Revelation 17, and it's right here. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. Who's the seven angels that have the seven vials? It's one of them that comes out of Revelation 16. This is the literary connection. I mean, you don't really need it. There wasn't chapters divisions when John the Revelator wrote this down. But for us here at the end of the world, we need to be reminded that Revelation 17 is directly connected with Revelation 16. And it's done so by the opening phrase telling us that one of the seven angels which dumped out the seven last plagues is the one that comes and tells John the Revelator what Revelation 17 is. So we're, if we're going to understand Revelation 17 um, correctly, we need to understand it in the context of Revelation 16. And uh, I think we'll show to you that one of the keys to understanding it correctly is to place um, Revelation 17 in the context of the beast the dragon, and the false prophet. This is the story of the beast, dragon, false prophet leading the world to Armageddon. It's the story of the healing of the deadly wound. And the first thing we're told in Revelation 17 is remember to understand it in connection with Revelation 16. Now, um, it's going to tell us about the judgment of the great whore with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. We've already read before that the woman of Revelation 17 is Rome. Great Controversy 382, and we've read in Testimonies to Ministers, page 38, that kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon. I would like to point out here that whatever the dragon is, at the end of the world, it is a multiple number of political figures. Kings, rulers, and governors, obviously um, civil uh, leaders. It's not a singular one, singular one, it's a plural one. And Rome, um, of course, commits fornication with ten kings. The judgment of the beast, the whore of Rome, with whom the kings, rulers, and governors that symbolize the dragon have committed fornication. Fornication is an unlawful relationship, prophetically the combination of church and state. This is the theme of Bible prophecy, one of the themes from beginning to end. <clears throat> judgment of the beast which is the whore of Rome, which is the papacy, with whom the kings, rulers, and governors that are symbolized by the dragon and who with the papacy have formed the image of the beast. Their fornication is the combination of church and state. And uh, this is um, symbolized in Revelation 13 as an image of the beast, combination of church and state with 
the church in ascendancy. And to be noted here, um, although in Revelation 17, you have to read between the lines or behind the scenes, however you want to say it. You're not going to see the false prophet um, on the front pages of Revelation 17, but we know because it's connected with Revelation 16 that we're talking about the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet is there. And so the false prophet uh, can be recognized by bringing Daniel 11, Revelation 16, Revelation 13, together with Revelation 17, and then we see the role of the false prophet. It's the one that is going to force this fornication upon the world. So here's verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Notice testimonies to ministers 112. The Holy Spirit has so shaped matters both in the giving of the prophecy and in the events portrayed as to teach that the human agent is to be kept out of sight, hidden Christ, that the Lord God of heaven and his law is to be exalted. Notice that it says both in the giving of the prophecy and in the events portrayed. The Holy Spirit has controlled not only the prophetic testimony, but he controlled the environment that the prophet is in when he receives the dream or vision, and he controlled how the prophet describes that environment. By that I mean, whatever is recorded in the prophetic word, it may not, it may not be the prophetic sequence of events, it may be describing what was going on with the prophet at that particular time, and whatever was going on with the prophet at that particular time is part of the truth that we're to understand. It wouldn't be there if the Holy Spirit didn't want us to understand. He shaped it so we would understand it. Not simply the events, but also the giving of the prophecy. So, John, first thing we're told in verse 3 is he's carried away into the wilderness. Revelation 12, 6 tells us where the wilderness is. It's the 1260 years of papal rule. Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. The wilderness, the 1260 year time period. Upon the testimony of two or three things shall be established. Revelation 12, 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. The 1260 years of papal rule is the wilderness. If you have time ever to look up uh, the, the series of articles by Hiram Edson where he identifies the glorious land as the United States, you'll see that one of the main purposes of his prophetic study is to identify that the 1260 years of papal rule was the wilderness and that the United States was the glorious land, the pleasant land that God was leading his people out of the wilderness into. <clears throat> Upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. So after John's carried into the wilderness time period, he's carried somewhere into this history, makes all the difference in the world, uh, where you place John. Uh, as an example, there are some people in Adventism um, that teach, and, and this particular teaching, it can be documented uh, when this teaching arrived in history. Um, a brother that does, a brother in Northern California has showed me the documentation that it, it was in the 13, 1400s um, that some of the cardinals that were striving to be the next pope um, they took Revelation 17 and they portrayed a scenario where the five that had fallen, the one is and the one that's yet to come and the eighth is of the seven were popes. They were doing that to prove that the current pope was unfit. But that's the, the first time in history you'll find people find the uh, first time in history and it comes from Catholicism. That's the first time, and I could be wrong about 13th or 14th century. First time that anyone applied the five has fallen, one is, one is yet to come and the eighth is of the seven, from Daniel 17, as popes. But if you will be faithful to verse 3, then you know that uh, John's carried into the 1798 time period, and there are some among us, and many outside of Adventism in the Protestant world, that suggest um, that these heads are popes, and they mark the time for this sequence of events to start in 1929. But we know that uh, John is in this history. 
Uh, the, the starting point for usually for the five popes that have fallen, the one is and the one that is yet to come, is 1929 at the Lateran Treaty where they teach that the deadly wound was healed. But the deadly wound isn't healed until what? Until the third geographical area is conquered. Then Rome begins to rule, rule supremely. That's based upon the testimony of pagan Rome and papal Rome. It gives us two witnesses that when modern Rome rules supremely, it's when she has conquered the three, third geographical area. But nevertheless, it was a big step in 1929 when uh, the papacy technically re received back their civil government. But if you, a close study of scripture and spirit of prophecy teaches that the deadly wound of the papacy is not healed until she has power to persecute again. Even, so the fact that she got her civil power in 1929, important step. But in any case, 1929 would be over here somewhere. John's back here. Um, and so the sequence of five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, would not uh, fit. So let's read 17 verses 3 through 6 to see what John sees when he's carried into the wilderness. So he carried me away into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet colored beast full of, the, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And you can see what I'm emphasizing here is the blood of the saints. And the reason for that is the woman was already drunk with the blood of persecution. And the question I always ask is, simple as it sounds, do you get drunk before you drink or after you drink? You get drunk after you drink. So if she's already drunk, it means that she's already partaken of the blood of martyrdom, which means John isn't simply in the wilderness here. He's down here at the very end of the 1260-year time period because the woman is already drunk. And you'll notice also another proof that he's already down here is when John sees her, she already has the title Mother of Harlots, which means um, the Reformation has already went far enough that some of the Reformed churches are already falling back under her influence and ceasing to progress out of Babylon. So, the persecution, great controversy, 306. In the Savior's, Savior's conversation with his disciples upon Olivet after describing the long period of trial for the church, the 1260 years of papal persecution, concerning which he had promised that the tribulation should be shortened, he thus mentioned certain events to precede his coming and fix the time when the first of these events, from the, when the first of these should be witnessed. In those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The 1260 days or years terminated in 1798. A quarter of a century earlier, persecution had almost ceased. Let me go mark this over here. Somewhere down in here, 25 years, if that's correct ratio-wise. Down at the very end, persecution had ceased. So the, the, the drinking of the blood of the martyrs goes up until there, and she's drunk in here. This is when... John Caesar, the, and it's, it's interesting how many times Sister White lets us emphasizes that the persecution ceases before 1798. Great Controversy 266, the persecution of the church did not continue throughout the entire period of the 1260 years. So we are suggesting here, like on the bottom of your screen, in the red, John is in the 1798 time period, the 538 to 1798 time period, Persecution is seized. The whore has already become the mother of harlots. John is at the very end of the wilderness time period. The woman has already persecuted and has reformed churches that are considered her fallen daughters. John is at not simply in the 1260 years of papal rule. He's at the very end of it. Verse 7 And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. Now, when, typically, when we think of a mystery today, we think of a, a book or a movie. 
that uh, keeps you guessing right to the very end, but then at the end you figure it out. It's a, something hard to figure out, but if, at the very end you get the punchline. But that isn't what a mystery in the Bible is. A mystery in the Bible is something that is deep and profound and beyond understanding, but what has been revealed about that un- mystery is required to understand. And here, we have a couple examples here. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is beyond our understanding. But what has been revealed about that truth, we must understand. And we must experience. So a mystery in the Bible is beyond understanding, but what is revealed about that mystery we must understand. And the opposite of that is the same in terms of what a mystery is. Second Thessalonians 2 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the out of the way. The mystery of iniquity is the mystery of sin, and the the entrance of sin into a perfect creation is beyond our understanding. But we must understand enough about the mystery of sin to flee from it and reject it. That's what a mystery is in the Bible. What's revealed we should understand, acknowledging right out front that some of it is beyond our understanding. So, the angel that came out of Revelation 16 is going to tell John the mystery of the beast and the woman. Um, What is a beast in Bible prophecy? A geopolitical, geopolitical kingdom. What's a woman in Bible prophecy? A church. So this is a, this is a mystery about church and state. Would you go with that? It's about a political power and a church power. So what's it, let's define some of these things that we're going to see as we walk through here. Kings are heads. Um, Daniel 2, 37, 38. Thou, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the fields and the fowls of heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. The king of Babylon is a head. A king is a head. Daniel 7, 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. Beasts are kings. They're interchangeable. They need to be defined by context. Beasts are kingdoms. Thus he said in verse 23 of the same chapter, Daniel 7, the fourth beast will be, shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. Horns, Revelation 17, 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Horns are kings. Notice the similarity of these symbols. Horns, powers. Signs of the Times, November 1st, 1899. The two horns like a lamb well represent the character of the United States and as expressed in its two fundamental principles, republicanism and Protestantism. These principles are the secret of our power and prosperity as a nation. Prophets and Kings, 581. Zechariah then saw the powers that had scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem symbolized by four horns. Horns are powers. The beast. So now, with, with those in mind, we're going to walk down through verse 8 of Revelation 17, 8. I've kind of broke it up here in a section. Um, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend. And uh, what it's defining here in this verse is um, who this beast is. The first characteristic that, uh, we'll, one of the characteristics to consider is that it's, it's the one that ascends. It comes out of the bottomless pit. It's destined to go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Shall ascend. This is from Daniel 1140. We dealt with this earlier. Come against him like a whirlwind. This against um, means to ascend. Um, In Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, one of the characteristics of Satan, and of course the papacy is just the manifestation of Satan upon the earth. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars 
of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. So this, one of the, the characteristics of this beast that was and is not and yet is, is that he ascends. Review and Herald, December 21st, 1897. It's always, you know, when you put this, the, the prophecy school together, you have to put the, uh, the different presentations together for one complete presentation. But when you do the prophecy school, you, you make so many points as you're leading up to the last couple days that you get down here to this area and you realize there's so many of these uh, things that we've already established, you can start moving pretty quickly if you want. Um, we've, went, we've read this uh, quote here um, a couple times at least, I'm sure, but we'll read it again. In this time of prevailing iniquity, the Protestant churches that have rejected it, thus saith the Lord, will reach a strange pass. They will be converted to the world. Um, if you're listening closely to Russell, like I know that you have been, this conversion to the world is talking about a, a, a binding off, sealing off time period um, where we're either going to be converted to the papacy or converted to Christ, converted to the Antichrist, con converted to Christ. In their separation from God, they will seek to make falsehood and apostasy from God, the law of the nation. They will work upon the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the protection of the state. The protest of the Bible will no longer be tolerated by those who have not made the law of God their rule of life. The bottomless pit. What we're saying to you in Revelation 17, verse 8, is that we are looking at the characteristics of the beast that was and is not and shall ascend. And you might look at the bottom of that verse. It's the beast that was and is not, and yet is. It's, uh, the beginning and the end of that verse is, is putting a little bit slant on this beast. The first pa passage, beast that was and is not, ascends. The last part, yet is. And uh, one of the characteristics of this beast, whoever he is, is it's the power in Bible prophecy that ascends, and I would suggest to you that that power is Satan and the papacy, Satan's front man on planet Earth. The next characteristic is that this beast ascends out of the bottomless pit. Um, in Adventism, one of the misunderstandings about Revelation 17 is that there is a power that comes up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11. I don't know if I look at that here. Let me go ahead and see. No, uh, I don't. But, so let's look there. Turn back to Revelation 11. Um, in verse 7 it says, and this, of course, is the French Revolution time period. It says, And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. In Adventism, we correctly understand here in Revelation 11 that this beast is the atheism of the French Revolution. So many Seventh-day Adventists, when they, if you turn back to Revelation 17 now, many Seventh-day Adventists, when they come to verse 8 of Revelation 17, they say, well, we know the beast out of the bottomless pit in uh, Revelation 11 is atheism. Therefore, uh, here in Revelation 17, this must be atheism. But Sister White doesn't define the bottomless pit as atheism, even though she speaks about that passage in Revelation 11. Um, Sister White tells us, and the Bible tells us, something different than, than that the bottomless pit represents atheism, and there are many people in Adventism that teach this, and what I want to tell you is if you're holding on to that view, if you're holding on to the view that in Revelation 17, verse 8, where it says this beast comes up out of the bottom pit, bottomless pit, and therefore it must be atheism, you may not realize it, but you're destroying the foundations of Adventism. Without a doubt, you're destroying the ad foundations of Adventism, and the reason for that is this. The foundation of Adventism that we will all agree about is that it's Daniel 8.14. But what empowered the message of Daniel 8.14 was the year-day principle being confirmed in 1840 in front of the eyes of the world on the collapse of the Ottoman Empire based on a time prophecy found in Revelation 9, verse 15. And if you turn back to Revelation 9, um, which the pioneers clearly understood... They, they took the understanding of Revelation 9, made a prediction about the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and when it came to pass, the, 
the angel of Revelation 10 came down out of heaven with the little big book open in his hand. This is the foundation of Adventism. This is where the manifestation of the power of God came into Adventism. It was based upon this fulfillment in Revelation 9.15. And what is this power? If you look at verse 1 and 2 of chapter 9, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit. The pioneers correct, correctly identify this power in Revelation 9 that comes out of the bottomless pit as Islam, what they called in their day and age Mohammedism. And if you're going to say that because we identify the bottomless pit in Revelation 11 as atheism and therefore the bottomless pit in Revelation 17 is atheism, then you need to say that the bottomless pit in Revelation 9 is atheism, and then you destroy our understanding of Islam, and you destroy the 391-year and 15-day time prophecy of Revelation 9.15. You destroy the year-day principle, and Daniel 8.14 goes tumbling down with it. Symbols have to be determined by their context and, and by their meaning. But anyway, when they have finished their temp Great Controversy 268, when they have finished, are finishing their testimony, the period when the two witnesses were to prophesy clothed in sackcloth ended in 1798. As they were approaching the termination of their work in obscurity, war was to be made upon them by the power represented as the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. In many of the nations of Europe, the powers that ruled in church and state had for centuries been controlled by Satan through the medium of the papacy. Now here, Sister White's going to tell us what the bottomless pit is. But here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. The bottomless pit symbolizes a new manifestation of satanic power. Now if you take that definition and you go back to the bottomless pit of Revelation 9, when Islam was coming into the the world, and it was symbolized as coming out of the bottomless pit at that time period when Muhammad was born, could you call that a new manifestation of satanic power? Well, yeah. What about the atheism that came into history in the French Revolution and it came out of the bottomless pit at that time? Was it a new manifestation of satanic power? Yes. yes. And here in Revelation 17, is it a new manifestation of sa satanic power? Sort of. Sort of, in the sense, it's been here before, but this is modern Rome. This is when the deadly wound is healed. It's a new manifestation of, of, of satanic power because when it comes to control the world this time, it's going to be the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. It's a new manifestation of satanic power. In, in, not, not strictly, but these other definitions contribute to it. Great Controversy 658. That expression, bottomless pit, represents the earth in a state of confusion and darkness is evident from other scriptures. Is a sta satanic power consistent with confusion and darkness? Is Satan confusion and darkness? Is Satan the prince of darkness? Review and Herald, July 21st, 1851. I told them that the Lord had shown me in vision that mesmerism, mesmerism, which is hypnotism in our day and age now, that mesmerism was from the devil, from the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit in Bible prophecy is something that comes from Satan, something from the prince of darkness, a new manifestation of satanic power. Now, what we're saying is that one of the characteristics of this beast in verse 8 is that it's the power that ascends in Bible prophecy, and I would submit to you that that's uh, either Satan or the papacy uh, by context, and that Whoever this beast is, it's uh, a satanic power. And I'd submit to you that Catholicism qualifies on both those places. And then the next phrase of Revelation 17, verse 8, is that it, this power goes into perdition. And there is a power in uh, Bible prophecy, in the Bible, that is identified, associated with perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So here's another characteristic of this beast that was and is not, yet is and shall, shall ascend. Fourth characteristic of this beast. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And purposely, when we were going through Revelation 13, we took time to identify some characteristics of the first beast of Revelation 13 that comes up out of the sea. 
and we reminded you at that time that we were going to refer back to those. And so what I'm suggesting here is that the first place that we look in, in the Bible to find a definition for a symbol is has the, that particular Bible author used the symbol or phrase previously? And sure enough, John has identified these, this same phraseology that's up here as one of the characteristics of the beast of verse 8, back here in Revelation 13, as the papacy. Because in Revelation 13, it says, They that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written. All the world wondered after the beast. All that dwell on the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So these first four characteristics, the power that ascends at the end of the world is the papacy. The power that comes from the bottomless pit, a satanic power, the papacy. The power destined to go into perdition, the papacy. And the power that the whole world will worship and wonder after, whose names aren't written in the book of life, once again, the papacy. The beast that thou sawest was, and in 1798, and why do I say in 1798? I say it because in verse 3, the prophet John was purposely carried away to the wilderness, but not just to the wilderness, he's carried right down here to the end of the wilderness time period, the 1260 years of papal rule. That's where inspiration wanted to place John in history, and brothers and sisters, prophecy is history. That's what it's all about. John's taken to a specific point in history for this riddle of five have fallen, one is, one is, yet to, one is yet to come, the eighth is of the seven, the beast that was and is not and yet is. That's, that's where inspiration tells us that John is placed. And he viewed the beast as past tense, the beast that was. Now, I'm telling you that what I'm suggesting to you is that John's taken right... I'm suggesting these are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, and although I haven't established these in the five of fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, the eight is of the seven yet, that's where we're going. And I'm suggesting that these kingdoms of Bible prophecy, the papacy ceased to be the fifth kingdom of Bible prophecy in 1798. So John is right in this area of history, if we will count these as a progressive history. He's right down here, but technically... He's in the wilderness, so he's still in this time period of 1260 years when the papacy ruled the world. But he's down there where the woman's already drunk. She's already ceased the persecution. He's at the very end. So is it okay in Bible prophecy to still be in the time period when the, a kingdom of Bible prophecy is ruling the world, yet prophetically identify it as being fallen? And it is, that rule is, you know, accept, is established in the book of Daniel. If you turn to Daniel, chapter 8, verse 1, it starts this way. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, who's King Belshazzar? Grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, he's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, but who is he? The last king of Babylon. So Daniel is in the very end time period of this kingdom uh, when he receives the vision of Daniel 8 and he sees the vision that we're familiar with. And then in verse 20, um, he begins to receive the explanation of this vision and it says, uh, the first kingdom of Bible prophecy is the Medes and Persians. Now, Daniel 8 begins the kingdoms of Bible prophecy in that vision with the Medes and Persians, but Daniel's still in the time period when the last king of Babylon was ruling the world. But when Daniel's given the vision of kingdoms of Bible prophecy at that time period, he doesn't include Babylon. Because Babylon, though technically still ruling the world, prophetically, was fallen. It was the, at the end of the time period when it ruled the world. So when inspiration set forth the kingdom of Bible prophecy for Daniel in chapter 8, it treated Babylon as if it was fallen. And this is the same as where John is here at the end of the time period when the papacy ruled the world. 
This beast, in John's point of view, in verse 8, was the beast that was. Now, the beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend, and yet is, is not. The 1260 years of papal supremacy began in 538 and would therefore terminate in 1798. At that time, a French army entered Rome and made the pope a prisoner, and he died in exile. Though a new pope was soon afterward elected, the papal hierarchy has never since been able to wield the power which it's possessed before. In 1798, it is not. It was. It is not. No longer the kingdom of Bible prophecy. But it shall ascend. And I don't know how many times we've read this in this prophecy school. The influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed, and prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. The papacy is destined to ascend. The Great Controversy, 581, speaking of the fact that the papacy at the, in this verse is not ruling the world right at this current time, it says... God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are. Only when it's too late to escape the snare, she is silently growing in her, into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. If you've ever been to South America and in between meetings you're in these big cities in South America and you go walk around these Catholic churches and, and if you're a Seventh-day Adventist that thinks about this particular quote in the spirit of prophecy, you do walk around these big churches and you see, ah, the, the, the floor is way above ground and you can see where the stones were put in the windows and the doors on this foundational level, and then when you go up in, up in the church, there's no way to get down there in that basement, but you know there's something down there. You can tell it. But that's definitely outside <laughs> the scope of this presentation. Um, she is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already be being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. Is the papacy in power today? Yeah. No, 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 no. Her deadly wound isn't healed. She has not conquered Egypt. And in the story of Elijah and John the Baptist, where is the papacy? She's, she's in the background. She is, but she is not. She was, but she shall ascend. Oh, okay. Now we are on um, a very, this is, I like this one. This, uh, this, give credit where credit is due. I learned this from uh, Brother Russell. Um, there is a, there is a um, pattern established in Bible prophecy, and it basically is, I, let me make sure I'm here. Uh, yes. It is that Rome always comes up eight and is of the seven. And upon the testimonies of two or three, a thing shall be established. So let's read Daniel 7, verses 7, 8, 23, and 24. <clears throat> You'll see what we mean when we get through this, once we start, if you haven't um, saw, recognized this before. After this I saw night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the other beasts that were before it. Please note that pagan Rome here is diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before, before whom three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, the Hurali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great Things, action of legislative and judicial authorities is the speaking of a nation. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth, fourth kingdom upon the earth, 
Now notice, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them. Now this is the papacy. And he shall be diverse from the first and he shall do, subdue three kings. Both pagan Rome and papal Rome are the diverse kingdoms in Daniel 7. They're both portrayed under the, the general heading of diverse kingdoms. But in the simple math of this, what we have is the ten kingdoms of Europe. And three of them are going to be removed. And of those seven European nations, out of one of them will come the papacy. Because one of those seven European nations was Italy, okay? So the Hurali, the Ostrogoth, and the Vandals were removed. So we're talking prophetic here, and we're talking a little simple math. The three are removed, leaving the seven European kingdoms, and up comes the papal power, but he's of the seven because he comes up in Italy. So what I'm saying here is in Daniel 7, Rome comes up eighth and is of the seven. And... Uh, here we're dealing with papal Rome. You got, the, you got the phraseology there? You got the phrase? Rome is always eighth and is of the seven. This is Daniel 8. Verse 3 in Daniel 8. A ram which had two horns. This is the, just the prophetic flow through Daniel 8. Who's the, the ram with two horns? Medes and the Persians. And in verse 5, there's a goat. Who's the goat? Alexander the Great, and the goat has how many horns? So with the two horns of the Medes and the Persian, that makes three. But in verse 8, Alexander the Great's horn gets broken off, and how many horns come up out of that horn? Four, so that makes seven, right? And then in verse 9, what do we see? We see the little horn. And who is the little horn? It's Rome, only this time, primarily, it's pagan Rome. Pagan Rome here comes up eighth and is of the seven. That's twice that Rome has come up eighth. Revelation 13, on the testimony of two or three. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads. I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Now, in Revelation 13... We see seven heads. This time it's not horns, it's heads. Of course, horns, heads, kings, beasts. Very interchangeable terms. Revelation 13 here. We have seven heads, but what's the problem with one of the heads? It's, it's dead. It's dead. But it's going to have its deadly wound healed. Now, I, I, I hesitate. I hope nobody stumbles over this. In that sense, in these seven heads, you've got a dead one, but there's going to be one come back to life, which is the eighth, all right? And, and this eighth is of the seven, because when it comes back to life, it's the one that was dead within the seven, okay? So Rome always comes up eighth and is of the seven, and this time it's not papal Rome. This time it's not pagan Rome. When the deadly wound is healed, this is modern Rome. So we have three testimonies that Rome always comes up eight and is of the seven. Follow me? Simple. <laughs> but, you know, really clear. Let's read verse 11 of Revelation 17. And you tell me who this beast of verse 8 is that was and is not and shall ascend. It says, and the beast that was and is not, verse 11 is taking us back to verse 8, to the verse we just defined, the beast that ascends, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, the beast that goes into perdition, the beast that the world wonders after and worships, that, whose names aren't written in the book of life. This is the beast of verse 8 because it's the beast that was and is not. And it says, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. You tell me who the beast is. This is Rome. This is Rome. And he goeth into perdition. Okay, it is the next one. The seven mountains of Rome. And here, verse 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Uh, where does the woman, who is the woman? We've already defined that. The woman is the Roman church. Uh, Mystery Babylon, Sister White, great controversy tells us that. We don't need that. All you need to do is get a dictionary 
that's a, a little bit old, and it'll tell you that the Scarlet Woman of Revelation 17 is the Roman Catholic Church. We used to know it in Protestant America, but Laodicean condition is not only in the Adventist Church, it's in the world, and America has went to sleep. So in the Great Controversy, page 124, it says, At last he beheld in the distance the seven-hilled city. With deep emotion, he, Luther, prostrated himself upon the earth, exclaiming, Holy Rome, I salute thee. Now, as we've said several times before, prophecy can have primary and secondary meanings. And the standard um, traditional Adventist understanding here, verse 9, is that these seven hills that the woman sets on is the seven-hilled city of Rome, and I certainly agree with that. Um, but there's probably more in this verse than I certainly recognize. But it also sets upon um, seven horns, seven heads, Horns, kings, kingdoms are interchangeable, and seven mountains. And uh, it also, in the chapter, in verse 3, it sets upon a scarlet-colored beast. It sets upon many waters. Um, this is uh, where the papacy sits, but it's also defining in verse 9. Let's read verse 9. And here is the mind that which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman setteth. Um, let's see where we go here. Seven heads, hordes, kingdoms. Verse 9. At least at one level of this, the seven heads that the, are, the horror is setting on is representing civil power. And I don't know that we have did enough homework uh, to argue that case fully at this point, but I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> the dragon power in Bible prophecy is the one that is associated with civil authority as it comes down through history. Um, it's the one that the pagan Rome is the civil authority. Uh, it's the one that invented civil government. It's the dragon power. The dragon power is associated with civil authority. And the seven European kings are symbolic of the civil authority that was given to the papacy in the time period when the papacy comes to rule the world. So at least at one level, when we see the woman setting up on seven kings, I'm not saying that it's setting on the seven European nations. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this can be understood as a representation of the civil authority that manifests itself through um, the dragon power as it comes down through history. And why am I saying that? I'm saying that because one of the stories that is told in Revelation 17 is the combination of church and state. Um, and you can see um, a little bit of that uh, that I didn't read. And she sits upon seven mountains. So I'm suggesting that the mountains here represent churches. And the reason you can get that from Isaiah 2, you can get it from Daniel 11:45. The glorious holy mountain is God's church. So if you have a mountain in Bible prophecy that isn't God's church, it's the other churches of the world. So here we see. The papacy setting on, on seven kings, which can symbolize the civil government in the world, and at the same time setting upon the seven mountains. And you can find the glorious holy mountain here in, in Daniel eleven forty five. And then if you turn to Isaiah 4, 1, which is a parallel verse here to verse 9, it says in, in that day, and if you read Isaiah 4, and it's not on the board, and I don't hear... Um, your Bible's flipping, so we need to go back just so you get the point of reference. Um, Isaiah 4, if you, if, if you read from the very beginning, yes, yes, but I, I want to go back a little bit further. The vision of Isaiah 4 begins in Isaiah 2. And in Isaiah 2, verse 1, it says, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days. And then, of course, it defines what the mountain is. But this vision continues on. So when you come to Isaiah 4, 1, what you're carrying with you from Isaiah 2 is that this is the last days. And it says, in that day, in the last days. Seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Seven mountains, seven churches. And in that day, seven women, also churches, shall take hold of one man, 
the man of sin. Now, if you read the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, they'll say that these women are taking hold of Christ, but this cannot be, it cannot be, based on the verse, Isaiah 4.1, what do the women say? We'll eat our own bread, and we'll wear our own apparel. Now, does a Christian church wear its own apparel? Does a Christian wear his own apparel? No way, this can't be a Christian church. These are seven churches, and what does, this, what does seven mean? Complete, total? Uh, it's saying here that the papacy is going to control all the churches at the end of time in, in Isaiah 4.1, that the, the churches are going to do what? Take hold of one man. What's it mean to take hold of one man? They're going to come into unity with the papacy by giving homage to the papacy, and how do the churches give homage to the papacy at the end of the world? At the Sunday law. They're going to take a hold of one man, the man of sin, saying, we will eat our own bread, we will wear our own apparel, let us be called by thy name to take away our approach. Four points there. Bread, apparel, name, reproach. Running out of time, so I don't know if we'll get through them. We'll go, we'll see. Testimonies, volume 5, page 330. We'll eat our own bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God are the words of the Savior. Errors in doctrine are multiplying and twining themselves with serpentine-like subtlety around the affections of the people. There is not a doctrine of the Bible that has not been denied. The great truths of prophecy showing our position in the history of the world had been shorn of their beauty and power by the clergy who seek to make these all-important truths dark and incomprehensible. In many cases, the children are drifting away from the old landmarks. To eat your own bread is to partake of your own doctrine. We are our own apparel. We are to bring the, to the lost the tidings that Christ can forgive sin, can renew the nature, can clothe the soul in the garments of his righteousness. These seven women are not clothing themselves in the garments of Christ's righteousness. They're wearing their own apparel. Let us be called by their name. The third angel's message has, not been sent forth to the, has been sent forth to the world, warning men against receiving the mark of the beast or of his image in their foreheads or in their hands. To receive this mark means to come to the same decision that the beast has done and to advocate the same ideas in direct opposition to the word of God. It means to have the same character as the papacy because at the end of time, name is character. Take away our reproach. Those who have been distrustful of self, who have been so circumstances that they have not dared to face stigma and reproach, will at last openly declare themselves for Christ and his laws. These churches are the ones that are afraid to stand for Christ in the last days. And so what verse 9 is saying, in agreement with Isaiah 4.1, is that in the last days, the papacy is going to take control of church and state. It's going to set on both of them, and that all the churches... And all the civil powers are going to come under the control of the papacy. But primarily, it's saying that the papacy is seated in the seven-hilled city of Rome. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we wish to wear your garments of righteousness and not our own garments. We ask that you would make... Um, this a reality in each and every life in this room, each and every life that uh, may listen to this information. And as the Sabbath um, approaches, we ask that you would lift our hearts and our minds up to you, that we can uh, participate in the holiness of this time. Uh, help us be quick to discern, opportunity to serve, and uh, be a blessing to one another throughout the Sabbath, that it might be a, a day that your angels are here with us, moving among us. Continue to pour your spirit out upon us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.